Hello everybody. Good morning from Adelaide. Um, today I'm very honored to have Professor Dr. Alphonse Fischer here with me and he is going to present about dirty tribology. I have known Professor Fischer now for 18 years. He was my material science professor back when I was an undergrad in Germany. Um, I also did him then later my uh, masters together with him in Chicago where he is joining us in from now at the Russian University Medical Center. And um, I have to say that uh, yeah, Professor Fischer he was yeah, what I would call a mentor to me. Um, without him, maybe I wouldn't be where I am now and would call myself a specialist in uh, wear and corrosion protection. Uh, thank you, Alphonse. Um, Professor Fischer he studied mechanical engineering uh, in Bochum in Germany. Um, he also did uh, then his PhD there and um, after his PhD, he went to um, uh, industry and uh, was working there for four years. Since 1906, he has been a professor at the University of Duisburg Essen, just retired in 2019 because, because he really likes his work. He continued in now at the Max Planck Institute for Eisenforschung and uh, still visits regularly uh, the Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. He's also the uh, chief editor of uh, WARE and uh, he has um, yeah, co-authored uh, five books and uh, 240 papers. He's going to talk today about dirty tribology. I will let himself explain what in me that means. Um, but even before I give over to Alphonse, I would also like uh, to invite everyone from industry out there who is watching today uh, to get in touch with uh, the SEAM team to uh, talk about collaborations how we can collaborate in the future about tribology, wear, corrosion, or surface engineering in general. Thank you, and I give now over to Alphonse for his uh, presentation. Thank you. Good day, and thank you very much for having me presenting my dirty tribology talk in the version 2.0 about dry and boundary lubricated wear from the real world out there and how we can by a systematic approach, solve problems from industrial applications, even there is not everything fully understood by fundamental research uh, results. So I retired two years ago from my job as a professor after 26 years at a university in Germany and was happy enough to get two offers, one from the Max Planck Institute für Eisenforschung in Düsseldorf and one from the Rush University Medical Center in Chicago because we had joint projects before my retirement and so I was happily, very happy just to go on with the research, but without faculty meetings and without committee meetings, just research, research, pure fun, I would say. The problem always was for the last four years, uh, s since I'm working with industry and try to find solutions, what I call well-aimed, so without trial and error, because after trial and error, you might have the best solution, but you don't know why. And one important sentence that my professor as a master student, Erhard Hornbogen, uh, told me at the University of Bochum in Germany was, Mr. Fischer, anybody can measure that, but can you explain it? And certainly at that point I couldn't. So I had to get back to my office and think about it. A week later, I showed up again, said, now I have an explanation, which was not so good, but he had a better one but at least I gave it a try. And for all this trial and error stuff, I'm by far too lazy. Why dirty tribology? Pretty simple, because I was very angry about presentations from wonderful people who presented absolutely Premier League research on uh, the fundamentals of friction. So they take a couple of molecules and shift them for a couple of nanometers to the left and to the right or up and down and then they show us dissipative mechanisms, which is very important. So I love these people, I love their research, I always enjoy the Golan Research Conferences, but in 2018 these people started to talk about where and what this molecule shifting, as I call it, uh, might have an implication for real applications out there. And I became really angry. Still, the nature and science community applauded it because they loved it. The real world out there community just left the room. So we went for some bottles of Sam Adams to get over that. 
So I thought that I come from the dirty world out there. So please, in your ultra high vacuum simulations and experiments, please talk about friction, teach us something about the dissipative mechanisms, what we call the elementary processes, which helps us to optimize systems well aimed. And please, please don't talk about where. We have an approach which was developed more or less in the 1970s by Horst Sichos from the BAM in Berlin. So we, we have a tribological system. Uh, we have a base body, sometimes a, a counter body. In, in erosion or cavitation, uh, there wouldn't be any counter body, but in sliding where you would have, you have interfacial medium and you have surrounding medium or environment. Then you have what you can measure, normal force, relative velocity, the temperature, the outside temperature, and maybe the endurance, you know, lifetime, that can be measured. What can be analyzed afterwards are the wear appearances or phenomena, so how your surface looks like. You, we can measure the loss of frictional work or frictional energy, and we can certainly measure some loss of material, so the wear loss. While there is no direct relation between the two, this is what we call the wear characteristics. But when we analyzed, for instance, the structure of the system, which is macro scale. You can do this with a bare eye. This gives you just a name for the problem. So we call this type of wear, sliding wear, abrasive wear, abrosive wear, cavitation wear, you, you name it. You know, might know all these terms, but it does not give you anything else. So you do not know what is really going on on the surface and maybe even below the surface. What we know from the types of wear is that they are also characterized on the micro scale and sometimes on the nano scale by a certain combination of acting mechanisms and sub-mechanisms. And this is when the music comes in. Because what we don't know, what we really don't know, is the real contact area or the real contact pressure. We don't know the mechanical properties of everything which is in between here because it's sheared at mild and ultra mild wear rates this is what the industry is asking for. I will come to that point later on. Uh, again, the shear rates are larger than 10 power by 8 per second. And uh, uh, think about whatever method to measure the properties of, of something which could be a mixture of everything and seriously contaminated by dirt and all of that. Uh, how your, let's say, stresses and strains react under shear rates of that magnitude. I wouldn't know any, so if you have a brilliant idea, just let me know. And below that, there might be something taking place that we call ratcheting or cyclic creep under a multi axial cyclic stress field. And this plays together, and we do not really know the interdependencies. The only thing what we know is that when we just concentrate on the four main wear mechanisms, uh, which more or less is state of science uh, from 1947 to 1987, so roughly 40 years of, of basic and applied research, we know that the wear rates might increase by nine orders of magnitude. This is one billion, you know, it's, it's a question whether you part less one day or a billion days. That's quite interesting for industry. So uh, Zunga put that together. He mainly worked uh, on abrasive wear and he more or less introduced what we call the sub-mechanisms. And he, uh, in his books and some uh, uh, published papers as well, he took this k value, which comes from the Archer equation. And so he showed where laboratory work normally could be located when it comes to these k values. So the abrasive wear is mostly around here. In severe wear, it's sliding wear, it's roughly the same, while in mild sliding wear, it could be smaller. The problem is that when it comes to real applications, this K value in the sub mild or ultra mild wear regime must be distinctly smaller than 10 power by minus 7. And 99.9% .9 of the published wear rates from laboratory tests are much bigger, much bigger than 10 power by minus 7. Most of them are in the range of 10 power by minus 4. So you lose roughly 5, 6 or 7 orders of magnitude lifetime if you do something here 
and you don't know whether the mechanisms and sub-mechanisms and, and whatever contributes to the wear behavior in your laboratory test at these high care values has anything to do with what you aim for in real applications. Okay, so again here are the four main mechanisms and Zunga introduced the sub-mechanisms for abrasion. Others did not really introduce sub-mechanisms, but if you read the literature of the last 70 years, you can take papers from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s and, and uh, after the millennium and, and, and then locate them down here as sub-mechanisms of the four main mechanisms. Many people say that, okay, this is practical application and this down here, this is science. It is not. Down here, at very small wear rates, you can optimize industrial application tribological systems well aimed. You only have to do a little bit of analysis and a lot of thinking. Down here, and this is not a closed line, it's a dotted line, so that things can go up and down here. This is what is published in Nature and Science. And these interdependencies, how everything which is going on, for instance, in metallic alloys, which could be anything and it could be nothing, and it could depend on anything and it could depend on nothing. You know, these interdependencies, this is what hasn't been sorted out yet in full. So this is what we are still working on. Question is, what would you expect from a real surface at sub-mild or ultra-mild wear? You normally you check the near surface, what we call tribal material, and the subsurface strain gradient. This picture, for instance, has been painted uh, by, by uh, Chichos in a, in a paper in the early 1980s based on a book from 1936, where we, it was just described in wording. So you have the base material, on top of that you have a strain gradient, which is uh, more or less generated by the accumulation of cyclic plastic uh, strains. And uh, so, and by that accumulation, the strains become bigger. So the gross strains become bigger and bigger toward the surface. And all of a sudden, always uh, uh, over a very sharp line, uh, you get some nanocrystalline uh, stuffs, more or less generated by severe plastic deformation, quite similar to shear bands. And that might in incorporate some stuff from the in envir uh, environment as well as from the interfacial medium, for instance, in the lubricated uh, contact. For instance, if you do this uh, from hip joint, cobachrome, molybdenum alloys, Mark Rainfall and, and uh, uh, Dr. Zheng helped us with this uh, years ago. So you have the base material with some uh, stacking folds and twins, and then towards the surface, the lattice defects increase until you get this peculiar structure. So here there's nothing, while everything just goes on what we call discrete sliding planes. And then you have this very sharp uh, line above which everything is nanocrystalline. And more or less this structure follows very nicely uh, this sketch. If you then analyze the surface, for instance by AFM, which in this case has been done by Sergei Basniov, in Sylvia Speller's group when she, she was still at the Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. You see these are remains of the lubricant, in this particular case denatured proteids and wear particles, which partly agglomerate outside of the contact. In contact we think they stay as small as you would normally find them here and then you can do some measurements and find that, the, that these particles have a nanometer size, so most of them are below 100 nanometer. The problem is that, for instance, in sliding contacts or rolling contacts, the tribal material belongs to both bodies. So you cannot even see where the real interface is, because this rotates. If it would not rotate, it would not allow for the extreme shear rates of 10 powered by 8 per second. And, and by rotating, even here this nanocrystalline metal, because nanocrystalline metals don't have to generate dislocations within the nanocrystals, all these grains just rotate. And by rotating, they, everything which is on the surface, more or less, is incorporated in something subsurface, uh, which changes certainly the chemical composition of the uppermost layer. And this is why we call this mechanical mixing. It's not mechanical alloying, 
like uh, you m might know from polymetallurgy, it's mechanical mixing, because you generate a composite of everything that was not fast enough to get out of the contact. And uh, um, it's a sub-mechanism of tribochemical reactions, because the chemical composition of the surface is completely different from everything underneath. And now if you separate both contacts, you might get this sample, or you might get this sample. So if you only analyze one, you do not even get 50% of the entire story. So you always have to analyze both surfaces and see what's going on, because both in combination, if you do the separation process correct and do not immediate cleaning afterwards, might tell you what has been this stuff in between, what we call tribal material, that allows for the accommodation of the extreme shear rates in such a contact and not generate large wear rates. It has been already described in the late 70s and early 80s by Maurice Godet from uh, Lyon uh, in his third bodies model. And he showed already 40 years ago that is, it is of protecting nature. So it's good news. It's not bad news. And roughly 20 years later, uh, Dave Rigney did some uh, simulations together with Mark Hammerberg. Uh, and he could show that there is a, even in ultra high vacuum in this particular case, because these people don't like oxygen, uh, uh, that there are things going on which you would ever think about. But what David showed already in 1999, he said that everything rotates in here. So this is not a clear shear uh, and, and that this interface walks up and down. It's a totally chaotic uh, process. Yves Berthier from Lyon, who uh, worked with Maurice Godet uh, when he generated uh, his third body model, he was able to quantify that. So he says, you have, if a total mass of particles that detach from the surface, and that does not mean that they leave the system, because only the particles that leave the system can be pronounced as wear loss. Everything else which stays in the system is not wear loss, it's still there. So he quantified, he could say, if there is a certain amount of mass detached from the surface, there is a certain amount of mass that is ejected from the system, which is the wear loss. But in between, this is the third bodies that stay in contact. And with respect to tribological measurements or real application, you can transform that this is the average depth or volume of a wear groove, which does not represent the wear loss. Not per se, it could, but it must not. And this is the particles and ions and mass you find outside of the system, maybe in the lubricant, which can be analyzed. The particles can be analyzed as well as the ions. And the difference between the two is the particles and ions uh, uh, in the tribal material that can be analyzed, for instance, if you clean your surfaces afterwards and you don't spoil that cleaning liquid down the drain, so in the gutter, then your message is gone for sure. So you can analyze that as well. Problem is that post wear analysis is like watching the closing titles of a movie when you see all the actors and who did the lightning and, and who did the camera and who the director was and everybody expect from you that you tell the, the whole drama, which is not that simple. This requires uh, some thinking and certainly also some um, uh, experience in the field. So in the applied tribology, we, uh, we, apply, we developed that route from going from macro, uh, what is the structure of the system, to micro, what could be the main mechanisms, what would you expect, to nano, if necessary. Because at ultra-mild or sub-mild wear rates, the activated volumes in both surfaces very often are just in the nanoscale. And so your answer, if you would like to get even smaller wear rates, lies in the nanoscale. And then you have to analyze it. But you never start there. I tell my students, you know, analyzing in the nanoscale is a lot of fun, but it would represent a fingerprint in a soccer field or in Australia, a fingerprint in a rugby field. And you have to be sure that that fingerprint is characteristic for the rugby field. So I tell my students, always start with a path to the stadium, check the stadium, then you check the field in total, and then you go from macro 
2 milli, uh, 2 centi, 2 milli, 2 nano, if necessary. You don't have to go to nano in any case. That depends on the part in the tribal system you're dealing with. So the, we kept it as simple as possible. Mechanical engineering has to be, but not simpler. That's the thing. We even have some papers on it, some, some German standards. And by the way, both of them are in English as well. And I can only tell you it worked so far. It worked in understanding many, many different tribal systems, very big ones, very small ones, and to optimize them without running, running too many tests. In most cases, we analyzed worn parts and the materials and the alterations on the surface and especially below the surface told us a story whether you are sailing very close to the waterfall or whether there is a certain safety margin still possible. So, a simple question. Because people said that if you rub FCC alloys against FCC alloys, you get scissor, so they will stuck. And in a hip, metal metal hip joint, they don't. So our question was, why does it work at all? And the second question is, why do some of the FCC metals in such a contact generate nanometer size wear particles, while other ones generate micrometer size wear particles? So we took different FCC alloys, a high nitrogen steel, a classical chrome nickel steel, a cobalt chrome alloy, and because we thought it's unfair to compare a high nitrogen steel to a classical chrome nickel steel, we also took a chrome nickel steel with a high nitrogen contact for comparison. And then you run a disk on pin test, so we wanted to make sure that all the wear particles just fall out. Then you get a certain running in. This is the sum of the wear of the pin and the disk. You remember, you have to analyze both bodies in such a system. The tests were run in dry air. There was absolutely no lubrication. So you get a running in and then you come in steady state. And in steady state, two steels here, more or less, showed 50 to 100 times bigger wear rates than the cobalt chrome uh, molybdenum alloy as well as the high nitrogen steel. And the difference we could see on the surface is you have a lot of grooves here, which certainly uh, point to abrasion, but it's not micro cutting, it's micro plowing, meaning you generate grooves mainly just by plastic deformation. So you do not generate that much wear loss. Your entire dissipative mechanisms go into plastic deformation because these wear rates here, you see it's 10 powered by minus 7 roughly, it's uh, 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 and it closing into nearly 10 powered by minus 8. The wear rates is still very, very small. But these two steels generated micrometer size wear particles, and so it was clear these wear particles generate these grooves. The other two materials, also face centered cubic, generated very, very tiny grooves. And again, they are attributed to micro plowing, and you could still see some tribal oxidation. So thick oxide films here, which were able to survive because the grooves were very, very small. And both of these materials generated nanometer size wear particles. Question is, why? So you make a cross section. And I apologize for the blunt picture. It's the only one I had. Uh, I have left base material, strain gradient, tribal material. If you check the tribal material in the TEM, you see that all steels have a nanocrystalline tribal material. So there is no difference between all of them uh, uh, within the tribal material that would explain the totally different tribological behavior. So we could attribute what's going on there to micro plowing during running in. So lots of plastic deformation, severe plastic deformation is going on, generating shear bands, incorporating some oxides, there was some tribal oxidation going on and certainly mechanical mixing. But the big wear particles destroy your contact situation. But then your contacts are limited to very, very, uh, uh, to a very limited number of mobile asperities. This is how I look at wear particles, while these nanoparticles uh, can act like a lubricant. The strain gradient was totally different. So with the materials which showed a very, very good tribological behavior, we only found uh, uh, dislocations, uh, twins and stacking faults on what we call discrete sliding planes, just 
conservative sliding down here in the strain gradient, while the materials that generated micrometer-sized particles, we found cell walls, meaning the dislocations could cross light and climb and generate the cell walls, which are very well known from fatigue. And it's also known that within the cell walls, they block each other so they can't move anymore. While as long as the lattice defects uh, stay on the discrete sliding plane, planes, they also block each other, but they remain mobile. This is typical for planar sliding materials under fatigue loading, while this is typical for wavy sliding materials under fatigue loading. So, meaning here, the crack initiation and propagation in order to generate a wear particle, one of the nanometer size wear particles, must have started here. While if you get micrometer size wear particles, crack initiation and propagation must have started down here. So the difference between good and bad was not the hardness. It was more or less the metallurgy of the materials that are responsible for either wavy or planar sliding. So in order to optimize these systems, you need materials that would under fatigue loading, even at high cyclic stresses, within the strain gradient only uh, uh, remain on the discrete sliding planes so that the entire crack initiation and propagation in order to generate a wear particle takes place here or here. And then the wear particles remain nanocrystalline. We were able to sort that out, let's say in a first rough approach. I thought it's a stacking fault energy, which is not the full message. The full message is it's a ratio between the density of free electrons on the sliding planes divided by the stacking fault energy. So this has been sorted out pretty well for copper base alloys. There are still some near field effects which contribute to that, but I have not been able to sort that out. And whenever I talk to real fundamental material scientists, can we do something on near field effects, they run away. So if you know somebody who would be interested in doing something down here, please write an email. <laughs> I'm still looking for somebody. But at the first hand, you know, you can just read fatigue papers. The best thing would be multi-axial fatigue papers and see whether there is a material that stays under planar sliding conditions, uh, no, no matter what cyclic plastic strain uh, takes place. Uh, and this should bring about within the FCC group smaller wear rates because it generates nanometer size wear particles. Pretty simple. So, things in mechanical engineering, most parts are made not from FCC, this is by far too expensive, but from BCC materials like martensite. So, gears, for instance, mostly done by carburized, carburized steel, so you have a high hardness at the surface, and you have for the ductility and some safety a lower hardness but higher toughness in the core. Same is true for, for instance, for shafts, which uh, the bigger ones are done from cast irons. You can do flame hardening, more or less gets the same thing, but cast irons are like cast irons are with a lot of scatter. So what do they do? We, we had different ways how to generate the surface. It was a milled surface, a ground surface, a milled and finished surface. So you could still see the milling lines, but the peaks were a little bit flattened. And we also had a polished surface as well for comparison, because most tribo tests in the lab are done on, with polished surfaces and not with the real surfaces at the end of a classical fabrication process. We ran all of these samples under boundary lubricated conditions under different parameters. To cut a long story short, this is carburized steel against carburized steel. The body was uh, milled and milled and finished in these two cases. The pins were always polished. So then when you do EBSD, you could see the Martin side. It's a bit tricky with EBSD, but Priska Stemmer was able to do this. And uh, um, you see the wear scar on the milled surface, and you see here the wear uh, scar on the uh, uh, counter body. This was the incipient surface after the uh, fabrication process, and that has been worn down here in that wear test. So after wear, this is the surface here in this area, 
and below that you see there are so-called no counts the black area means no counts meaning the deformation is so large that we are not able to measure it by EBSD and these strains here were not there before so they have been generated in this martensitic material during the wear process while the base material this is area one here base material is microcrystalline the strain gradient here is deformed microcrystalline material with a lot of defects and the tribal material up here is nanocrystalline so it is more or less the same structure as we have seen for the FCC materials but now in these applications sometimes you only have two micrometer one micrometer or half a micrometer for this entire picture here if you finish the surface you still see the milled rough surface but the peaks are taken away again this is the counter body we were not able to measure anywhere uh, at the same coefficient of friction just to mention that but we were really not able to measure anywhere so we thought we knew this is roughly mild wear this is ultra mild wear where we would like to go so this is a surface after the fabrication process with the strains this is a surface after where you see the same strains more or less the same structure so you cannot really know whether these strains have been generated by tribological interaction or whether these strains have been there before so Prisca uh, quantified that the polished pins there were no this is the surface of the polished pins here at the sur at, at the zero level meaning uh, they were polished to perfection in the laboratory there were no strains at all below the surface while after milling uh, on the base body here you have this uh, severe plastic deformed material which is the red color and below that you have a strain gradient and here is the base material so after wear you find in the base body similar things certainly there was a little bit of wear so this is gone and then you find uh, your, your shear band the tribal material mechanically mixed and then you find the strain gradient but this is overlapping this one it is for the ground as well for the milled and finished so here you cannot really say that this comes from tribological interaction it has been there before from the polished base body here we found tribal material and we found a strain gradient meaning this has been generated under tribal lodge in our uh, tribal test as well as it has been done in the counter body but the counter body brought about most of the wear in all the system while these two showed ultra miles sliding wear so this didn't really matter certainly people say that the counter body always wears more than the base body but again that rule is not really true it could be exactly the other way around we did the same thing with flame hardened spheroidal cast iron and that has been uh, uh, tested against uh, uh, the bearing steel 50 to 100 and you see this is the red ones this is what we deal with the carburized steels and this is what we did with the cast iron against the bearing steel and you see the wear was much much larger and if you again check the same picture all the wear has been brought about by the 50 to 100 steel even though this was much harder than <coughs> uh, the cast iron and uh, the question is how can that be P many people say if it's harder it must be most wear resistance and I can tell you 99.9% .9 of materials never read that paper they just don't know they do what they want so there is no direct correlation between hardness and wear I'm terribly sorry whenever I get a paper for the journal wear which brings about that relation I have a ton of arguments why this is not true anyway the question here is why is the 50 to 100 so bad because normally it's a real wear resistant stuff I think it's because down here after flame hardening the cast iron had compressive residual stresses again a question pops up the compressive residual stresses are roughly 800 megapascal while the real contact stresses which had been simulated here by Daniel Stickel in a parallel uh, PhD thesis is 8 gigapascal question is how can 10% of the of the real loading uh, in the real contact area have that effect 
on, on the good performance of the base body, I think it's, it's, it's not that magnitude of compressive residual stresses. It comes from the fact that it shifts the, the multi-axiality factor into the negative, <clears throat> meaning that, uh, uh, that crack initiation and propagation are hindered. If it would be on the positive side, crack initiation and propagation <coughs> would be much more likely, excuse me, so that these 10% of stresses uh, uh, just bring about a very, very positive effect. And so the 50 to 100 has no chance because it has no compressive residual stresses. So because Chrissy asked me to say something about uh, coatings with it, especially spray coatings, I added uh, uh, some other things at the verge between fundamental and uh, applied tribology, which is covered by the PhD thesis of uh, Marai Kahan. So the question is, if the nanocrystalline surface in your tribal system is so good, why don't we just generate a nanocrystalline coating on the surface, which lasts forever? And would that also work in ferritic or ferritic politic steels? Because again, they are even cheaper than the Martin City stuff. So there was a project for small and middle enterprises from the German government about 10 years ago. And so we had these small and middle enterprises here in that project. And I, you know these people, the Gitte Frau of uh, Doc Whetstone, they presented uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, within the same seminar. And we certainly you need some customers for them. So we added some other typical German small and middle enterprises that got funding from the government. You might have heard of them. They're really small and they're really, really middle-sized, but we had a lot of fun. So first thing is we got a cylinder that had been uh, for 60,000 kilometers on the German Autobahn and uh, uh, in order to find out what is going on in reality. This is, you know, macro with a path to the stadium. And we found it's not one driver system, it's a it's four driver system in our case. It's a, the combustion chamber, the top dead center, the stroke, the bottom dead center, and we can compare whatever happened here has started with something down here in the unloaded region. And so we were able to compare over the entire cylinder wall as well as uh, on the ring side. So it was about coatings, so sprayed coatings. We had two processes in the project, the, the PTWA, uh, uh, process, plasma transfer wire arc, and the HVOF. So this was, let's say, the European part, and this was the American part. And what we found in both processes is that by, if you take, I would say, a fence pole, iron with 0.1 weight percent carbon, you generate normally a ferritic perlitic structure, which in these spraying processes generates a lot of micrometer-sized splat grains, and inside the splat grains, you get a very, very fine precipitation of the cementite. And from the environment, you introduce a little bit of oxide with this process and a lot of oxide with this process. So beside the cementite as hard phase, you get additional oxides for free as additional hard phases. So we checked in the transmission electron microscope and we found that the cementite as well as the oxides, which were mostly wustite, are nanocrystalline. So this pretty simple material by these two processes generates a nanocrystalline coating. To cut a long story short, so we check the surface in the stroke, which is very well lubricated. So from reaction products from the combustion chamber, which are introduced, you get some scratches here. Sometimes a splat grain falls out, but nobody really cared about it because this gives you an additional oil retaining volume. <coughs> the bottom, <coughs> that center uh, uh, looked not quite the same because uh, there we found remains of a strain gradient, but more or less these both areas were not really a problem. The top dead center is of uh, uh, high interest. Certainly we start with a combustion chamber because we found a strain gradient and a nanocrystalline material as well, which, which has been generated, we think, by these explosive stresses, some sort of some impact wear, I would say, by, by the gas itself. You find some amorphous stuff, you find remains of everything that has been there in the combustion chamber and burned into soot or hammered 
into one of the surfaces, oxides, everything. At the top dead center it became even more chaotic because you find a laminated structure of uh, former coating material of remains of the piston rings, of remains of combustion products, everything mixed into everything and again everything was nanocrystalline. So we thought that as well as in the combustion chamber, as well as the top dead center, these nanocrystalline stuff that comes in parts from the coating and in parts from the counter body as well as from the environment on combustion products has a protecting surface because the wear rates were really small. So to cut a long story short, uh, the thing is that within the stroke certainly you get one of these grooves but the wear was negligible. So there was really no, no problem even if it looks like that way. And at, but at the top dead center we found the structure we already have seen with the FCC materials as well as with the martensitic materials from the base material, which in this case had been nanocrystalline already. We found remains of a strain gradient, mostly uh, in the bottom dead center, because at the top dead center it's so hot that uh, even dislocation cells start to recrystallize and, uh, and vanish. But we over, always found these shear bands uh, with the incorporation of the interfacial medium and environmental stuff. So in this particular case was a ceramic, graphitic, organic, metallic, nanostructured composite. The thickness, by the way, was 50 nanometer. So I found out with my car, which is a diesel engine, I have 50 nanometers that gave me the 220,000 kilometers that I rode that car in the meantime, mostly on the German Autobahn. So if this very thin shear band, which is very soft if you shear it, and which is able to accommodate these extreme shear rates which out, without the, just falling off the surface, is supported well enough by the underlying strain gradient. You know, every thin coating has to be supported well, other, otherwise it cannot show that it's a wear resistant coating. So this combination, which more or less you get for free, so you get nanocrystalline matter that lasts for a long time for free if you choose the right metal in combination with the right process for a certain application, you know, you get very, very small wear rates. So in this particular case, the mechanical mixing was most pronounced at the combustion chamber on top, etc., or more or less brought the story. Uh, it was about diesel engines and we know that, for instance, that the diesel suit uh, certainly can lead to abrasion but must not necessarily lead to high wear. That has been shown uh, by Martin Dienwebel because uh, uh, it has no dangling bonds on the outside while gas suit is much more aggressive to the cylinder wall as well as to the piston ring. What was my personal problem with that project? So we measured uh, the wear volume in laboratory at 80 degrees C uh, in order to, to, to mimic the, uh, this, this boundary contact without additional suit particles. Um, so this is the wear volume uh, plotted over the accumulated frictional energy. Again, both cannot be directly related. This is the nickel zeal stuff, which is not used anymore because the nickel nanoparticles are not too healthy for anybody who would uh, breathe them. Uh, this is the stuff that the industry used and of which they thought it should have a, uh, a smaller wear rate. So this wear rate was too, too good here. The wear rate, they would say, yeah, it was not too bad, but the friction was quite low. Uh, this is the material that I developed within that project because I did a lot in the early 1980s with iron, carbon, uh, chromium, boron alloys. Uh, uh, in order to use borides instead of carbides for a wear resistant and certainly you, you do something which is close that the people did in order to generate metallic glasses so uh, and I never wanted to generate it something which is amorphous but it's very easy if you play around with chrome and carbon and boron to generate something which is uh, per se nanocrystalline so this stuff was very nice because uh, industry said with respect to the frictional energy that's absolutely okay we accept it and your wear rate is so small this is really good stuff 
My problem is that this here, the fence pole, it's an iron carbon LO with 0.3% carbon already with respect to the wear rate was what they wanted to have. So they thought about, we must not make Mr. Fisher rich in why we use uh, his alloy. We take a fence pole and do a very well controlled PTWA or HVOF process and we get everything we want for a little amount of money. Today you can, for instance, refurbish uh, old machinery with it and the refurbished ones are better than the new ones because of these coatings. What is the take-home message? Check your wear rates in your tribometers in order to the magnitude that you would like uh, uh, to have a comparison for whatever application you aim for. That's quite important. You don't have to run a wear test for 30 years, for instance, in energy engineering, because they ask for 30 years uh, lifetime, but you can run a very small wear rate and then analyze the surface. And maybe if you're lucky compared to something which lasted for 30 years, if you get hand of these parts, for instance, after maintenance. The grooves you see after wear test <clears throat> and after cleaning of the samples do not represent the wear loss. So if you clean the parts immediately, more than 50% of the message you would have liked to get uh, maybe down the drain. We should know this since the early 1970s already, and I think today we can do better. So after you analyzed and understood the tribal material, and I have to confess, I analyzed a lot of tribal material, but I only until today understand very little of, uh, of the data that we find there. So very often we have to do a, a different analysis to validate what we see, because very often we don't believe the numbers until another analyzing uh, process tells us is right. This is what's going on in the contact. So check your mechanisms and sub-mechanisms, whether they match the application you aim for, and check the altered microstructures at interesting uh, locations for the initiation and propagation of cracks in order to generate wear particles. So if you just have nano size wear particles in your system, so you check the uh, tribal material, if you have micrometer size wear particles and a very thin shear band on top here, you have to look here because you have to optimize here, not here, you have to optimize your system down here. Certainly you measure the hardness in order to know what you have in your hand with your base material, but hardness and nano hardness have equivalent strain rate of 10 powered by minus 2 per second, while your tribal material undergoes equivalent strain rates which are bigger than 10 powered by 6. It could be powered by 8, 9, 10, 12, depending on what model you use. And so whenever you use hardness to characterize this stuff here at the surface, you go wrong by a minimum of eight orders of magnitude. And this already should be known since a minimum of 20 years. And certainly you know that friction cannot per se be directly related to wear or wear loss. At the end, I have to thank by far too many people that would fit on just one slide. So here are just some names. I have to thank countless numbers of bachelor and master students, including Chrissy, uh, that were much smarter than I was, and they, have, and they are much smarter than I will ever be. So if you hire PhD students and bachelor and master students in your institute, which are much smarter than the professor, that is my message, everything's fine. And the professor, like me, can sit in his office, be important, do phone calls, drink coffee, eat cookies, and have the smart people do the job. I always have to thank Hans Berns, more or less my mentor, uh, Dave Rickney and Duncan Dowson for their patience during the discussions, for their politeness during uh, the discussions during the last 40 years, more or less. And I was always the rookie when I was discussing with these people, and I'm still the rookie in tribology. I know I can more or less do as if I understood what I uh, just talked about, but be sure we understand a little, but most of the stuff which is going on there at these extreme small areas, we still don't know, and we cannot relate that directly to any elementary processes, but we are working on it. So, thank you for the invitation that I uh, could give this talk. Thank you for your attention. 
Whenever there is a question, write me an email to Max Planck or to Rush. I read them all. And if somebody tells you you don't know what you're doing, your answer should be yes. Because Albert Einstein, and I'm not comparing myself with Albert Einstein, but he said if we would if if we would know what we are doing, this wouldn't be research. So whenever somebody, if you ask for money and he asks you, do you know what you're doing? Your answer should be, no, I don't. This is why I do research. Thank you very much for the application. Any question can be directly uh, sent to me because in travelogy there are no stupid questions. Thank you. And I hope to see you again, Amy, for another talk in the CIEM webinar series soon. Bye-bye.